So in case of so my this paper is titled Authority and Delegation in Online Communities. And uh, what I try to address in this paper is uh, 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 one important question that many platforms face, which is how platforms can incentivize uh, user-generated content. So as you may know, many platforms rely on online communities of users that participate voluntarily. So this is the case of Wikipedia, for example, but many also question and answer website, product forum support. Uh, on the, in all these platforms, there is a community of users that participate voluntarily and provide the content. And this content is useful for the company to, to survive and to be successful. So there's a lot of literature studying what type of uh, motivations bring these people in and uh, how the platform can incentivize participation. So this paper, I'm going to study one specific uh, channel that could be uh, used by platforms to incentivize uh, uh, participation, which is the delegation of authority uh, over specific tasks that users can make within the platform. And in more specifically, I'm going to look at editing tasks and I'm going to be specific in a minute. And I'm going to use for this purpose uh, data from Stack Exchange, which is a question and answer website uh, well known for computer science questions, but uh, is very much used in many other topics of Q&A. So let me go more specific. So in online communities, mainly people can do two types of things. Either they can contribute with some content. So it can be articles, for example, in Wikipedia. But in the case of Stack Exchange, these are answers that people can provide to other fellow users that have asked some questions, right? And then the second main action that they can take is to edit the existing content. So this editing task is much more diverse across platforms. And in particular, it's diverse the way people can do this task. So in many websites, editing is just a suggestion. So basically, people provide a flag, a comment about some content, and then other users or managers of the website will be in charge of of deciding whether the suggestion is valid or not and then implementing the suggestion. On the contrary, other websites like Wikipedia allow users to directly modify the content, which means that if I'm a, I'm a user in Wikipedia, I just find that some content is wrong, I directly modify it and publish the, my modification. Okay, so in this case, I said that instead people have full control and authority over the action of editing because they don't need to wait for a third party to actually confirm that, uh, that modification and that edit. Okay, and then there is a, a, a third type of, of platforms like Stack Exchange, where uh, people can gain full control and authority over this editing task, but this is conditional on some performance measure. So basically the platform set an observable measure that the platform can control. And once users achieve this, a certain level of performance, then they are able to fully implement their edits without waiting for third party to approve. So clearly, this decision, uh, the platform has to decide how to uh, allow users to make edits. And the, the objective of the platform is really to find the ways to incentivize users to, to produce content and to edit content. So they may want to incentivize both content production and editing. So, the question is how delegation over this action, so more control over this editing task, may indeed help the platform to achieve this purpose and to incentivize participation. So let me explain a bit what type of incentives delegation may create. So consider a situation in which people participate in a online community can gain some reputation points. So in Stack Exchange, people answer some questions. And then other community members will, will upvote these, these answers, for, for example, if they like it or if they find, they find it useful. And then these upvotes will provide points to the, to the uh, author of the answers. So the author will accumulate the reputation points. And then once I reach, reach a threshold T, then he gains this authority I was mentioning. Okay, so just to recall, before they reach this threshold, people are still able to edit content on Stack Exchange, but these edits are just suggested. So other users or, or, or editors have to approve the modification that the user is suggesting. Once they reach this threshold T, then they are able to directly implement their edits. Okay, this doesn't mean that this content can be edited again by others, but they have full control over the actual implementation of, of their edit. So this creates two possible incentives mechanisms. One is what I call dynamic incentive effect. 
if users value to gain authority, so if users value to reach this higher level of authority over editing, then they may be in willing to put more effort before the threshold to reach this threshold faster because that uh, because arriving to that threshold will give them specific higher utility okay so and i call it dynamic incentive effect because uh, if people discount time this incentive is stronger when people approach the threshold at the same time there is another type of incentive effect that i call static incentive effect so if, we, if people value to have authority, like if people specifically have a higher utility by ma making, making action when they have more authority on, the, on those actions, then uh, to provide more authority over editing would relax the participation constraints on in some ways affect that participation constraints and, and in some ways affect the, the, the level of participation of the users. Clearly these two incentives effects are maybe conflicting because uh, uh, if I move this threshold up and down, I may shrink or, or, or increase the size of, this, uh, of these effects. So in this paper then, uh, what I will do is first of all, to identify what type of users are at, acting in, in the website. And this is mainly because we know that in platforms, there is a lot of heterogeneity of what type of user participate and the incentive systems may be differently affecting different type of users. So my first, my, my, the first point of the paper is to identify what type of users are out there. And then I will use a dynamic discrete choice model to estimate those preferences for, for gaining and having authority. In other words, I will try to use a dynamic model to, to infer how much people value uh, to gain and to have, and then how much they are sensitive to the dynamic incentive effect and to the static incentive effect. Okay, so this is only achievable with a dynamic discrete choice, with a dynamic model and not with a reduced form evidence, because the, the, clearly the, the time at which users achieve this threshold is endogenous to their decision process. So we really need a forward-looking model that incorporates the, the decision of the, of the users. And that's why I'm using a structural model. I will estimate these preference parameters for each type of user that I identified in the first step, uh, so that to, to understand really who is sensitive, sensitive to what and potentially which type of users the platform is targeting once implementing one incentive or the other. And finally, once with this preference parameter estimated, I will uh, simulate counterfactual analysis to uh, really understand for the platform, from the platform perspective what is the trade-off that the platform is facing when pushing uh, uh, on the dynamic incentive rather than the static incentive by shifting the threshold level, right? So the idea here is that the platform can move from a Wikipedia extreme case to a core extreme case, and then can decide how much challenging to set this threshold by, and in this way, affecting the, the size of the static and the dynamic effect. So this is gonna be the purpose of the counterfactual analysis. So the literature that I touch on this paper is threefold. So first of all, I touch the intrinsic value of authority literature that studies experimentally how people may value uh, to have control over decision making. And in this case, I will, I will kind of confirm these are experimental results with using non-experimental data. I then, I then uh, contribute to the organizational economics literature by bringing to the empirics uh, the theory that studies how delegation can be used as an incentive device. And finally, I contribute to the information system literature that studies non-monetary motives and, and participation of users in online communities, uh, proposing this, like studying this novel channel of, of incentivizing participation. So in this paper, I will first, so for the rest of the talk, I will first show you what type of data I use and how I identify the type of users. I will explain you the delegation system in place in Stack Exchange, how I estimated the preference parameter through the structural model and the counterfactual uh, analysis. So if there is any question, I can maybe answer now or... No? There is uh, no question in the okay. chat, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Perfect, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let me go ahead. So, 
Stack Exchange, as many of you know, is a, web, is a platform that hosts many question and answering websites. And each of these websites focuses on a specific topic of, of Q&A. So the most well-known website is, is Stack Overflow that is focusing on computer science and, and, and programming languages questions. Uh, but then on this uh, specific paper, I'm going to focus on the one called the English Language Learners, which is a question and answering website that focuses on questions related to the use of English, specifically for foreign learners. Um, this, this, the, the reason why I'm focusing on this, on this website is that the text of this question and answers are, is mainly textual, so there is no code or other type of features, that, uh, and then it's more easy to measure quality of these answers um, with text measures. So uh, yeah, for now, yeah. sorry, there's now a question from uh, Oren. Oren, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it directly? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, it's just a question about kind of like the forces of the model. So you talked about the fact that there is two tier and you talk about the incentive of the users. I was just kind of wondering about the incentive of the platform to have this, um, this two-tier system. Uh, so it seems to me like it would be maybe about identifying who are the high quality users and then letting them do the edit. So that means that the users that have editing rights are going to be not just have different incentives, but are going to be at the type, quote unquote, of users. So I was just wondering if the model kind of speaks to that as well. Yes, yeah, so, so you're, you're mentioning about the idea of uh, uh, quality of users in the editing task, for example, or? Yes, I mean, it's easy that the, the, the platform does it because it wants to make sure that your comments or in your edit makes sense before they need to do it, and, you know, without right. any limitations. So right, right. that would be... Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point, and uh, so this is all at the point of you know like using the threshold rather than as an incentive device, more like as a selection selection device, right? Um, so this paper focuses more on the first uh, role of, of setting delegation, like uh, setting the threshold, like uh, on potentially its role in delegation. But clearly, I agree with you that that could also have a selection mechanism that I still have not investigated in this paper. Great, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, so as I was saying, I'm using this data from this website that uh, for which I observe the, the, the full content. So all, all, all answers posted uh, from 2013 to 2020. Uh, for all active users that are around 10,000, and of which I observe the full history of participation um, within the website. So how identify uh, user types? So the reason, so one key, uh, key idea of this paper is that uh, I didn't want to identify type of users from actions that they make because potentially um, uh, I wanted to, 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 use, to, to observe exposed if the user types identify do differ in terms of actions. What I wanted to find it was one way, the, the idea of finding these types example was to uh, um, you know, recover from the data what uh, the motives somehow that brought the users to, to participate in the website. And with this idea in mind, the, the, the way I, I, I identify user types is by using information that they display on their user profiles. So I recollect all user profile pages of, of participating uh, uh, members. And after recovering information of what they displayed in that page, um, I use a data-driven approach combining a multiple color correspondence analysis with a k-means clustering to cluster these uh, users in different groups. Okay, so this is really like a data-driven approach based on what type of information users display on their user profile page. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to go in detail on the technique, so, but if you have a question, let me know. So the, 
Yeah. Jacopo, sorry. At, at a high level, I, I have a question. Um, at a high level, what do you take? What information do you take into account to cluster individuals? Is it the text? Is it the pictures? I use uh, kind of everything that uh, people can decide to display or not, which is the picture, which is uh, the, the presence of a website, the presence of a LinkedIn profile, the size of the biograph biography, and this type of and some text information of about the biography they write whether they have a full name or just a nickname and, this, and whether they have location, all, all this type of information that you are free to use or not when you register on the website. And the idea is that when I register on a website, uh, I decide to disclose what I want based on, on what type of reason I'm registering. So <clears throat> the, uh, after this process, uh, I identify three types of users. Uh, and, and, the, and naturally, the, the identification of these groups is really based on uh, what type of information uh, the, the group display. So the, the first group that uh, is the most numerous one, the, the largest group, is what I call anonymous, which is uh, um, uh, a group that does not display information. So basically, uh, you, as you can see, they don't have... Uh, uh, mo they mostly don't have information about themselves, they don't provide the LinkedIn or website information. There is then a second group of users, that is the second largest, which instead provide information, so normally they have a biographical uh, description, they have a full name and website and so on, but do not have information about uh, their external life outside the community. So they miss the LinkedIn profile, external links, and uh, they have, uh, to, less, to less degree, their personal website. And finally, the informative users are users instead that uh, uh, provide a lot of information about all dimensions, including information about their life outside of their community. So this is a bit how I uh, identify these three groups. And uh, uh, just to quickly give you an overview, these groups are very different also in behavior. Uh, and they tend to, anonymous users tend to be uh, the one um, so, uh, le, so the informative users are the one mostly producing uh, uh, in, in, the, in the platform. So they are very few, but they participate a lot and they are having an important uh, contribution to the final production of the website. And they are also the one that uh, receive more, more medals and so on. So let's say that there is a correlation between more information and uh, more activity and more productivity in the website. Okay, so let me move to uh, the delegation system and what the variation I use to, 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 that is affecting how much authority people have in the website. So as I mentioned before, uh, people can accumulate reputation points in this website. And once they reach, they reach a threshold, they get more authority. So this is the main uh, first variation that I use that, I, that allows me to compare users' uh, uh, histories before and after uh, they reach this uh, more authority level. And before February 25th, this threshold was set at 1,000 points. Anyway, the data allows me to use an extra layer of variation because this threshold has moved uh, in the, during the history of the website. And then I do observe not only uh, people that gained authority before and after the threshold, but also people that potentially lost authority, in, in particular if they had uh, uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 points uh, at the time of the change of the threshold. So these users uh, that uh, had passed the threshold under the previous, uh, under the first threshold set, uh, then they lost authority because they had not yet reached the second threshold. So how the threshold affects the user contribution? So the, the, the idea then of the structural model is to really try to study the, and to model the decision process that users make once they decide how much effort they make in the website. And the, 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 the crucial factor is that is to incorporate the forward-looking behavior of users that are anticipating the possibility to, to, uh, to reach this threshold in the future based on their current effort provision. So this is really modeled as a sort of an investment decision with decreasing returns because people uh, make effort today. This effort is going to produce uh, some reputation points uh, uh, tomorrow. And then also in the next days after tomorrow, but de decreasing, right? So this is the, how I model the, the, the investment decision of effort. And then the, this decision is really based on the idea that uh, these points in the future may lead them to reach this higher level of authority. 
And clearly, if people value reaching this higher level of authority, this, uh, this uh, preference is going to affect their today uh, uh, action decision uh, because uh, they will will be will more willing to, to put higher effort and to pay higher cost of effort today uh, to reach uh, faster this threshold in the future. So the, 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 the model then is the, the, the structural model is like a simple dynamic discrete choice where the choice set is going to be a discretization of the quantity and quality of, uh, of effort in answering and editing. So more precisely, uh, I have three dimension included in the model, like the A corresponds to the quantity of answers, E it corresponds to the quantity of edits, and Q to the qu quality of answers. So for now, I don't include the quality of edits because since they are very small modifications in general, it's hard to measure the quality. So I discretize this the three variable and obtain a choice set of 21 options. And clearly, combination of this option will lead to expected returns in terms of reputation points in, for the future. So I, I don't present here for the sake of time, but in the, in the paper, I have the modelization of these returns. And I estimated in a first stage uh, the arrival of points in the future based on the uh, all rate of arrival of points in the community. So people, users participating, make this decision and choose what level of effort to, to make in these three dimensions, such to maximize their expected discounted utility uh, of their participation in the website. And again, let me stress this point, like the key identification of, of the model is really like comparing the, 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 the different options and the returns that each option is making, uh, is, is, is giving them in terms of points. So if people value and put high value in reaching the threshold tomorrow, they're gonna, I'm gonna observe today a higher effort level. If instead people don't, uh, change significantly their effort level, even if they are, have a chance to reach the threshold tomorrow, then it means that they put low value in reaching the threshold. So this uh, difference across the, uh, uh, this, imp this different implication of their action today, uh, let me infer how much they value to reach the threshold tomorrow. Uh, Jacopo, Kevin has a question about um, if you can say more about measurement of quality, so that Q parameter. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, maybe I don't have a slide. So the, the measurement quality that I use is to recover a uh, text measure of the text. So they generally uh, I use uh, uh, the length of the text, uh, how many uh, significant words. So I, I discount from the number of words, the number of stop words that are like non-meaningful word. Uh, so I recover all these text measures and I regress these measures on the points that this, uh, this uh, post have received on the first day uh, of publication. Uh, and this uh, um, give me a, 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 an approximate measure of quality. Then I, is that clear? So in particular, just to double check, you don't take into account the votes from others to your answer. I take into account the, the, the votes on the first day of the answer. Um, and I use, so basically I regress text measure on the votes that the, the answer receives on the very first day of publication. Because then in the next day is potentially the, 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 the answer is, is modified by other people. So I really wanted to capture the quality made by the author. So I'm just taking the, the exact uh, text characteristics at the time of publication and I regress these, uh, these variables on, uh, on the number of, of uh, upvotes and votes that this answer got on the, on the first day of publication and the, and the, the predicted uh, number of, um, of points is like the, the level of quality of this answer. Okay, so the, the user preferences that I, I assume for this, for this model uh, are, are the following. So it's like a linear utility function uh, that includes, first of all, how many points people have at a given point in time. So in period T, R will capture how many reputation points people have accumulated uh, so far. And then I include uh, these two variables, CA and CE, 
that capture um, the net utility from answering and editing. So this can be the cost of effort in answering and editing, net of some intrinsic utility of making those answer, those effort decisions. So the, what I want to be explicit here is that the potentially users may have us intrinsic utility from, from answering and editing, which is then captured from the same variable of the cost. So this is gonna be a net cost of answering and editing. Then I include uh, uh, this variable CUM, CUMT uh, that corresponds to the cumulative number of privileges that people can uh, uh, obtain on this website. So I didn't mention, but uh, people can get more authority, but they can reach also other privileges in the website. And then this one to capture that uh, potentially uh, people just care about accumulating privileges and not specifically about authority. So that's why I, I want to include it in the utility function. And then I include a dummy variable equal to one if, uh, if the user has reached authority at the time t. So this is gonna be exactly one if people have more authority and zero otherwise. And then I, I interact this dummy with a constant uh, with, uh, and, and with this net utility from answering and editing, CA and CE. And then the utility function is gonna be a random utility. So there is an idiosyncratic preference shock epsilon it. Um, so yes, I didn't specify, but the way I model uh, this, uh, this uh, net utility from answer is gonna be like a combination of the quality of the answer and the quantity on the answer uh, weighted by the availability of, of, uh, of, uh, of questions. Because to, to answer is uh, easier if there is a lot of questions out there, out there that I can answer potentially, but if I, there are very few, potentially it's harder for me to, to answer. So I wanted to capture that. And then I measure, I, I weight this, uh, the cost of answering uh, by how many questions are available. Questions about uh, the utility function? No. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, no, I, I wanted to be more specific actually about, about that. So what are the parameters of interest of, of this utility function? So first of all, this beta file, that corresponds to the uh, to the additional effect that uh, the ad so additional utility that uh, that answering will bring to the to the to the user once it will have reached this higher level of authority, then somehow will uh, uh, measure the sensitivity of the user to the static incentive effect for answering. What I mean is that if this beta phi, for example, is positive, it means that people will be having a specifically higher utility in answering once they have reached higher authority on the website. Um, if instead is negative, it means that it's becoming more costly for users to, uh, to, to, to provide answers once they have more authority on editing. Similarly for beta six, uh, it will capture the sensitivity to the static incentive effect on editing. So if beta six again is, uh, is different from zero significantly, it means that uh, uh, the users will, will have a specifically higher or lower utility in editing once uh, he will have reached a higher level of authority. And then uh, the, the dynamic incentive effect is captured by all the, the whole interaction with this dummy variable. Because clearly if this uh, whole interaction is, uh, is positive or negative, then it means that the, the user will anticipate a positive or neg negative shock in utility once it will have reached the authority level. So this will impact his decision process before reaching the authority threshold because he's looking forward to this higher level or, or, or lower utility in the future. Okay, so if there is no question, let me move to the uh, results and the estimation, estimation results. So first of all, uh, let me focus on the, uh, on the beta, uh, beta five, which is the sensitivity of the static incentive effect uh, uh, on answering. So the estimates shows that uh, uh, only the anonymous users have a significantly different beta five, uh, which means that uh, in general, uh, users do not uh, um, 
I mean, they, 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 when, they, when users obtain higher authority on editing, uh, they, their utility in answering is not much affected. And in particular, only anonymous users receive a higher cost of answering once they pass the threshold, but the, 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 the size of this, uh, this effect is small. So this, uh, this uh, would suggest that uh, when allocating authority on, uh, on editing, does not uh, imply some specific negative utility on the other action. So there is no much spillover effect on the other actions that users can take. Uh, on the contrary, when uh, people obtain authority on uh, editing, uh, they have an increasingly higher value of editing. So as you can see, for all users in this case, and specifically for the anonymous users, um, when they when they, you, when they pass this threshold the t then they receive a specifically higher utility in editing so this is suggest that uh, they do have a specific higher preference of editing once they are endowed with uh, uh, with uh, uh, authority on editing and finally the, the constant of the authority already is kind of suggesting uh, uh, the direction of the dynamic the sensitivity of the dynamic sensitive effect which shows that uh, um, so it shows that the anonymous users and informative users receive a positive utility from reaching the authority, while identifiable users do not. So this is already suggests that the dynamic incentive effect would be specifically relevant for the anonymous users. So let me be clear because uh, of the size of the sensitivity. So to, to give a measure of uh, how much uh, users value to reach authority, so to get, uh, to say it in the word I used in the introduction, the value of gaining authority, um, the, the value for anonymous users correspond to around 250 points, which is something that they could be uh, obtaining with a 33 posts. And similarly, for informative users, uh, the value that informative users put in acquiring authority is 329 points, which is something that they will be able to get publishing 28 posts. As suggested before, identifiable users do not really seem to be sensitive to that, to that incentive. They don't seem to care about obtaining, uh, to gaining authority, so their value of gaining authority is quite low. So, once I bring these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these preference estimates to the counterfactual simulation, this will allow me to, to, to simulate how much production in the website will occur under different delegation scenarios. So in this, web in this slide, I will I'll show you just uh, uh, two types of scenarios. One in which the, the, the platform decides to not delegate authority uh, based on performance, but the delegate authority from, from the beginning to everyone. So this will be the extreme case of Wikipedia, where people have full control over editing tasks from the very beginning of their participation. And the second scenario is instead more mimicking the Stack Exchange setup, where people uh, receive a full control over editing once uh, uh, they reach a certain performance threshold, which is here set to 500 points. So. Let me discuss the, the three types uh, separately. So the most interesting types is the informative users. The informative users, as I mentioned before, are the ones that are the most sensitive to the dynamic incentive effect. This means that uh, if uh, I delegate authority to, the, to edit in editing from the very beginning of their participation, they are not, so basically I shut down the, the dynamic incentive effect system then I don't incentivize these users, the, the, the green slash users, right? So the production in the web is much more slack. If instead I delegate on performance, then the informative users are incentivized to produce more at the beginning to be able to reach faster, this higher level of authority on editing. And this is why we see this spike of contribution at the very beginning of the history of participation. Differently, the identifiable users, uh, as I mentioned before, they are not sensitive to the dynamic incentive effect. So by shutting down the dynamic incentive effect, I don't lose much of their participation. Finally, Jacopo, you have five minutes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Finally, you see these anonymous users on the, on the zero line. 
and this is because on the simplified setting of the of the simulation that the cost of participation for the anonymous for the anonymous users is too high so in this in the simplified setting of the simulation they have just so high cost of participation that they don't participate so even if they would potentially be incentivized by the dynamic incentive effect in practice they are not for what instead relates to the to the to the edits I, I hear I here want to talk about the static incentive effect of editing. So as I mentioned in the preference slide, uh, the estimates suggest that the people have a specifically higher value in editing once they uh, reach um, uh, at a higher level of authority on editing. This means that once I move to scenarios in which uh, the delegation is delayed, so uh, I'm waiting time to I mean, I, I, people need to reach a certain threshold level of points to be able to, to have a full control over editing. Then clearly I lose uh, editing activity because now people don't have a full control from the beginning. And then until they don't have full control, they will produce less edits. So every scenario that uh, increase and delays the delegation would imply a reduction of the amount of edits that the platform sees uh, on its website. Okay, so let me conclude overall. So in this paper, I tried to study how delegation of authority can be an incentive device, and try to investigate in particular two types of incentives. First, the static incentive effect. So this uh, is uh, the idea that people may value to have authority, and what the data shows is that indeed the people are more willing to participate in editing once they have more control on editing. At the same time, doesn't seem to be uh, important spillover effect on other tasks like answering. The other incentive effect that I study in this paper is the dynamic incentive effect that uh, show and and I, I, and in, uh, in the estimation shows that uh, indeed people uh, value to gain authority and in particular informative users and uh, and then they increase their participation in answering to be able to reach this threshold faster. As I said, this is in a way very much relevant uh, relative to the, to the type of users uh, that the platform is targeting. Informative users are very sensitive and they increase much their production to reach the threshold. But for example, identifiable users do not. And anonymous users, even if they would, they have very high cost of, of production, so they are not really responsive to the, to the incentives anyway. So just to draw some policy implication, uh, um, the, the optimal design of the website clearly depends on what type of users the platform is targeting and then on the composition of the community. And then also on the objective of the platform. Clearly, if the platform wants to maximize the quantity of edits on the website, it's better off in delegating from the very beginning because that will maximize the, the editing activity of the users. If instead the, 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 the platform uh, wants as well to maximize other tasks, we may want to delegate editing based on performance over other tasks. And this is the case of Stack Exchange. For example, Stack Exchange for sure cares about editing and improving the quality of, of answers, but as Q&A's website are, are two-sided platforms, it really needs to incentivize production of answers because otherwise we don't have the dynamics that increase the, the, the production in the website. And then for, for that, in that case, like exchange may be a better off in trading off some editing activity to, to incentivize uh, uh, production of answers. And with okay. this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Wonderful, you anticipated me. Thank you, Jacopo. Kevin, take it away. Uh, great, thanks, uh, Jacopo. Um, lovely presentation, um, you know, quite clear. And uh, the paper and the phenomena are themselves quite rich and interesting. Um, I'll, I'll have but a moment to, to discuss some of these things. I will disclose I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm somewhat biased towards the topic of you know I've written on on granting access and devolving control and looking at um, non pecuniary motivations and their effects on network effects um, and uh, industrial evolution in these contexts. So um, what I'd like to begin by stating is that. I do believe this is a very important topic. It's a first order topic. There was a time when we studied platforms, systems competition in which uh, we could model complementers as profit-seeking firms or in some sort of simple reduced form, 
Um, and over the past 20 years, really, the, the many of the complementers on the on platforms, contributors on platforms have become you know, behaviorally motivated, uh, non pecuniary motivated uh, agents, and certainly there's profit seeking as well. But but these are these are uh, now increasingly first order topics in, in what creates scale and um, and value in these in these contexts. A couple elements of this I'd like to especially welcome. Uh, you know, I believe you know, there's there's an element, and this this doesn't come out as much in the presentation as in the paper, but there's an attempt to kind of begin to frame this relationship between these complementers and the platform uh, along the lines of what we've seen in, or in the flavor of organizational economics and thinking about this as something analogous to a principal agent problem where there's a design of, uh, in this case, uh, control rights, um, where, where that's, I think, a fresh and useful perspective that we can take. Uh, industrial organization buys us a lot of traction in, this, in, these, in, in, in these contexts, but I, I do believe the organizational economics um, perspective adds more. Uh, and I also, I, you know, although these are behavioral phenomena and, 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 and in some sense difficult to fully uh, model, I do believe there's an open place for structural modeling um, in making sense of, of, of uh, what's going on in these contexts. So these are all sort of important elements of the paper I wish to, to highlight. And just before, you know, there are only going to be so many comments I can make. I would like to also say that uh, Jacopo makes some efforts in the paper quite nicely to, to, to tie this to, a, to a, a, you know, beyond platforms to literatures on delegation and you know, their papers by uh, Baker, Gibbons, Murphy, uh, Aguillon de Watrepont. Um, uh, there, there's this notion in that literature of a trade-off in that agents somehow have some kind of special attribute. In much of that literature, it could be uh, an issue of they have, they have privileged information, or uh, in this case, we're looking at privileged or uh, unique motivations that come through delegation. Uh, and I wish to just highlight that the trade-offs in those literatures are in some sense the decision to delegate or not or under what conditions. And the heart of this paper is really a different kind of trade-off. And, and I do think that, it, you know, I'll, I'll try to add suggestions as I go through this, but I think the paper could probably be clearer that, in fact, <clears throat> the trade-off that, is, that, is, that, that Jacopo is, is intending to bring to the fore here is there will be delegation. This is not a question. There will be, uh, in some sense, uh, the devolution of control to external agents, to these complementers. The trade-off is whether to, in, in some sense, delay or create a threshold for delegating, uh, or in fact, just to open it up more widely. And um, at, at the same time, it should be said that even that is not sort of the first order goal of this paper as I read it. In some sense, the first order goal is really an establishment of existence that, in fact, the delegation of authority is a source of motivation that has economically cons consequential results. And there's an establishment of uh, that basic establishment of fact even precedes anything of, it, of, of describing this trade off. There's this question of is there, in fact, uh, 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 an existence of this issue at all? And I'd like to just, uh, um, and I think the paper could probably go farther in um, distinguishing, you know, as we have all these thresholds that are being crossed, um, we're looking at one particular threshold that relates to editing privileges. And there could be any number of, of motivations related to crossing these thresholds or, or gaining these reputation points, as it were. It could be reputation and status. It could be in, in going through the system of, of various thresholds and gaining points, there's, a, there's an element of gamification and intrinsic motivation. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of other possible explanations going on here. And I think sort of the core message of this being a, a motivation of achieving autonomy, which has appeared in other literatures, whether that could be better established at its core. And I'll just, I'll just make a couple of comments now on um, within the empirical analysis, uh, amount analysis itself. In one minute, sorry. Yeah, um, the, there are, well, I'll go straight to the structural model. The structural model uh, gives a sense of dealing with endogeneity. However, it should be mentioned that, you know, in some sense it's allowing for there to be a distribution of responses to various variables, but there's enormous complexity in 
what brings somebody onto the platform, what makes them transition from sort of one observed type as it's defined to another observed type, to what's leading them. There's just a lot of detail that I think is missing in, in, um, in, in the model itself, which doesn't necessarily allow us to fully discern what is the, uh, what is the source of, of well, what, what, is, what is the source of, of the actual behavioral mechanisms and relating those to some source of exogenous variation. I'll, I'll share some more notes, but that's just sort of a quick kickoff of, uh, of issues.